His wounds have paid my ransom. Praise God. Well, we have returned yet again to our study in the book of Romans. This has been a marathon of a study and not a sprint. Uh, we have started this back in January of 2022, and here we are in <clears throat> 2023 plus. And so uh, God is good. He allows us to continue to understand the beauty and the depths of his word. Today, uh, we're going to have our next to the last message, Lord willing, uh, here in this section called Secured by Sovereignty. It is this chapters 9 through 11 that deal with the question of Israel. What about national ethnic Israel? Paul, you said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul, you ended Romans chapter 8 with these words, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. If that's true, Paul, then what happened to Israel of old? They were God's chosen people. They were supposedly redeemed by God, pulled into a land called his people. Paul, we would like to believe you, but you've got to answer a question. And that question is, what happened to God's Old Testament people? And that's really what Romans chapters 9 through 11 are about. Paul dedicated a fair bit of material in the book of Romans to this because it was such an issue. We've already looked at chapter 9, how Israel's fall from grace was actually part of God's sovereign choice and plan. How, and then chapter 10, we saw how it was actually Israel's fault in unbelief. They were being held accountable for human responsibility. But here in chapter 11, we're talking about Israel's future and God's divine plan. Can I just say this morning, God has a sense of humor. Uh, perhaps maybe a better way to put that is God has an amazing sense of timing or maybe even irony. If you have been doing the readings that come out of this guide that we put out at the beginning of the year, every year, if you've been doing the readings at all, this was your reading yesterday morning. Listen, Acts chapter 1. It says, and he, Jesus, presented himself alive to them, his disciples, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Verse 6, and when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has fixed in his own authority. Interesting to me that yesterday our reading was Acts 1 and the discussion of when is the kingdom to come, Lord? Also interesting to me that tomorrow just so happens to be the celebration of the 75th anniversary of Israel back in the land. Now in unbelief, no doubt. So we had yesterday's reading of when is the kingdom to come. We have Israel already in the land yet in unbelief and today we are in Romans chapter 11, and the topic at hand is this, mystery, the restoration of national Israel. Curious God's timing. I find it curious how, maybe you don't, but I do. And investing a lot of thought and time and energy into this over the last month, uh, this just seemed to be too good to be true. So I need to pray. I need to pray for me. I'm one of those crazy people who never gets any exercise except when he does it all at once. So over the last two days, I spent like four hours in the yard at the parsonage trying to clean things up. And yesterday, I spent four more hours in the parsonage trying to clean things up. And today, I am weak. Um, and maybe God wanted me weak this morning. I don't know. Uh, because the topic at hand requires weakness. Um, so let me pray. And then let's launch into this discussion concerning Israel in its future. Oh, Father, thank you that you are God. 
that you sit outside of time and see the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end simultaneously. All of it is fully in view to you now. And even in this moment, in this church, using this mouth, you not only knew about it, but you have ordained it today. And I pray that you would take your word, which forever lives, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, which is able to divide asunder the soul and the spirit, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts, that you would take your word this morning and draw it home to our hearts, I pray, Father. And uh, strengthen me to get through this. There's a lot here. Help me, I pray. In my weakness, I pray that you will be seen strong. Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So we're going to be looking today at verses 25 through 32 in the book of Romans. Now, just before we get there, let me do just a wee recap of Romans 11, if you will, kind of as a whole. So a few weeks back, uh, we spent some time in Romans 11, verses 1 through 10. And that was a clear look as the Apostle Paul was looking at Israel's past, their past, and how through their past they ultimately rejected God, and thus God rejected Israel. And we saw how, how all that played out and how Paul spoke into the reality of that. God rejected them because of their unbelief, but God has always had a remnant even back in that time of rejection. And then we looked at a chapter 11, verses 11 through 24, and we saw how Israel's rejection actually led to the gospel of grace going to the nations. If you're a Gentile here today and you love Jesus, say amen. amen. It is because God sovereignly set that nation aside that the gospel now has gone to the nations, to the Gentile peoples. This was God's design, God's plan. Paul is showing us, us the beauty of God's plan. But at the same time that the gospel has come to us, Paul's desire was that it ultimately also would stir the jealousy within Israel itself and that there would be those who would desire a relationship with God as they see the church experience it. And so even today, there are Jewish believers. They're called Messianic Jews, completed Jews, Jews who see Jesus as their Messiah now and they have been added to the church. So we've kind of already gone through that part of Romans chapter 11, but there have been a few little hints about the future. There have been a couple of teases about the future. One is in verse 12. I want you to notice what Paul says here. He says, now if their Israel's trespass, their sin, means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, notice what he says in verse 12. How much more will their full inclusion mean? Ooh, wait a minute. What do you mean full inclusion? And so here already in verse 12, Paul was teasing something. He's baiting us a little bit to say, wait a minute, Paul, what do you mean by that? And then again in verse 15, he goes on to say these words. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, the Gentile peoples, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So Paul has said their full inclusion, their acceptance, he's baiting us. He's saying, oh, by the way, there's more to come for Israel as a nation. And that's what we're going to be looking into today. These truths that there is a future for Israel and Israel as a national entity will have a restoration to the land by God's plan. And so baiting us just a little bit more, Paul goes on to say these words in verses 23 and 24. Notice what he says. 
And even they, speaking of the Jews, if they do, if they do not continue in their unbelief. So the idea is, oh, they may not continue in their unbelief. Even they will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. Verse 24. For if you were cut out from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted in contrary to nature to a cultivated olive tree. He's talking about us Gentiles being grafted in to the tree of salvation, the olive tree of salvation, which has its roots in the patriarchs, the Jewish patriarchs. How much more will these, the natural branches, Israel, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So he has been baiting us. He has been leading us to a conclusion. Paul, what are you talking about? Paul, what are you doing? Come on, Paul, say it. Okay, here we go. This is where we are today. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, Gentiles. I think this is really aimed at the Gentiles. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. How many like a good mystery? You know, uh, many people like to pick up a good Gresham novel or maybe a, a good, uh, let's see, some of the Brits. Oh, my goodness. How many watch British TV shows? Almost all of them are mysteries. They just have this hang up with mysteries. They like a good mystery. Paul's about to share with us a mystery. So the first question is, what is a mystery in the Bible? Let me, let me give you a definition of a mystery. The definition is actually found in Romans, uh, verses, uh, chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. This is what Paul says a mystery is. That which was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed. That's what a mystery is. A mystery is something that has been kept under wraps. Not really discernible for a very long time, but now is being revealed or disclosed by the revelation of God. So what is a mystery? It is that which refers to that which was previously unknown, but now revealed to us by God. Well, what is this mystery? Here we go. Gentiles, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. That which was not known is now being made known to you. And it is this. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Verse 26. In this way, all Israel will be saved. This is the mystery that was kind of hidden through all the Old Testament, intimated and, and thoughts were expressed about this, but largely unknown and now clarified by the Apostle Paul that there is coming a day where all Israel will be saved. Now, all Israel does not refer to every single Jewish person, but rather it is a statement as a nation. Israel as a unique nation ethnic people will be saved. National Israel will be saved. This is what verse 12 meant when it said they would be included. This is what verse 15 meant when they would be accepted. This is what it meant in verses 23 and 24, that they would be grafted back into the olive tree of salvation. What a mystery. It concerns national ethnic Israel back in the land now and a future for them yet. So the revelation that Paul is making known to us by God is that God's many promises to Israel of old will be fulfilled yet in national ethnic Israel. Promises like what? Let me give you a couple of the promises that were given in the Old Testament that will find their fulfillment when all Israel is saved. One of those places is in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. This is the new covenant. Listen to what it says. Behold, 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Notice the names he gives this covenant to. It is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is Israel. Not like the covenant that made that I made with their fathers on the day in which I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they broke, though they, uh, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Here it is. Here's the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one even have to tell his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. There's a day coming. Where all Israel will be saved. No one will have to say, oh, and this is the Lord. No, because they'll all know me. It was intimated here in Jeremiah in the new covenant. Now, the new covenant, again, when we host the table, we often read Jesus' words. And he says, and this is the cup of the, what is it? The new covenant in my blood. So the new covenant was initiated on the cross through the blood of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. this is one of those instances where we have an already, an, an inauguration of a truth in the church. Amen. But the ultimate fulfillment is not going to be realized until Israel and Judah receive the new covenant that God has established for them. So it has been initiated in Christ, and we enjoy the new covenant now as the people of God. But Israel doesn't yet, but they're the ones to whom it was given. And they are the ones who shall yet experience the new covenant. God will write his law on their hearts, and he will establish a new covenant with them. So that is one of the great truths of the Old Testament that will find its fulfillment on this unique day. Another one of those truths is found in Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel 36, we have these statements, verse 22. Therefore says, uh, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations which, to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. They're going to see this. They're going to behold this. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. They're wonderfully positioned already for the reality of this day to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And I will sprinkle you with clean water, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules." You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now, the truths here of God giving people the Holy Spirit and giving them a new heart is realized now in the church. When a person repents of their sins and puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit inhabits them. They have been born again. So it's already been inaugurated in the church through the death of Christ and trust in him. But it will not find its ultimate fulfillment until it comes to the house of Israel. And that is what this day is about. So do you see what Paul's doing? These things have been intimated all through the Old Testament. There are many more. And Israel, for the most part, has been cast aside and spurned to the nations. And Paul says, don't you think for one minute God's done with them yet? 
everything God has promised, everything that God has decreed, God will ultimately fulfill in ethnic Israel, the nation of Israel. So, as a nation, Israel will be fully redeemed from the heart. They will be filled with God's spirit. They will live in a loving obedience of God and follow his commands for the first time. For the first time. All through the Older Testament, there was always a remnant, a few here, a few there, that had a true heart towards God. But the vast majority, no. But this day, this day, they will have one heart, one soul, one trust, one person that they bend the knee to, and his name will be Jesus Christ. This day is coming. Paul is just saying all of these Old Testament promises will ultimately come to fruition, and they will come to fruition in national ethnic Israel. How? How will this happen? There is only one way anyone has ever been saved. All Israel will be saved. There's only one way that anyone has ever been saved. And that is when we understand the gospel, that we are sinners worthy of God's judgment. That's all we've earned. The wages of sin is death. We've earned that. Every one of us has. But then we behold Jesus Christ, God's son, who bore our sin. And and we believe. We turn from our sin and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We bend the knee, call him Lord, and get up and follow him with our lives. That's the only way anyone's ever been saved. If you're here today and you're born again, that's because you have turned from your sin. You have repented. You have put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. You have called him Lord and you're following him with your life. And all God's people said, there is no other way to be saved. That has always been the way that one is made right with God since Christ has appeared on this earth and so too Israel. Notice what Paul goes on to say in verse um, 26. Notice what he says. As it is written. And now he's quoting from Isaiah 59 and verse 19. The deliverer will come from Zion. And he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them. When I take away their sins. How is Israel saved? By all means, by grace. All by all means through the Holy Spirit giving them giving them life. They will see Christ. They will behold Christ. There is no other way to be saved but ultimately to see in the person of Jesus Christ your Savior. And so this is what will happen. And so we're told in Zechariah, these words, Zechariah chapter, uh, let me get there. I got so many little notes in here. I, I mean, I'm Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, okay, here we go. Zechariah chapter 12, listen. And I will pour on the house of David, again, we're talking the Jewish nation, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace. Who said grace? Amen. That's how one is saved. And, for, and please, for mercy, they're going to cry out for mercy. So that, listen, when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for their only child. And they shall weep bitterly over him as one weeps over their firstborn. And on that day, there'll be great mourning in Jerusalem. There is coming a day where all Israel will be saved, where they will experience the new covenant through the blood of Christ, where they will indeed have the habitation of the Holy Spirit in their lives, and they will now walk in the statutes of God. There is coming a day when that will happen. And that day is at the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he appears in glory, he says, as you watched him go. Oh, let me me read that. We were back in Acts. Remember we read in Acts yesterday? And we read these words. uh, And the Lord said to him, uh, they said, what time will you restore the kingdom? And he said to them, oh, it's not for you to know the seasons and that the Father has fixed in his own authority. 
And it says, and when he had finished saying these things, as they were looking on him, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went away, behold, uh, two men stood by them with white robes, angels, and said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go. He went in the clouds. He's coming back in the clouds. And when they see him for whom they pierced, they will mourn. Collectively, they will understand their sin. Collectively, they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Collectively, they will be saved. This is what Paul is saying is the mystery. All the promises of Israel of old, we thought were simply gone. Or as we'll talk about in a minute, assumed by the church. Not so. They will yet be fulfilled in and through the national and ethnic entity known as Israel. God will cause it to happen. When? That's the million dollar question. When does Christ return? Well, it says here, <laughs> it says here, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. Notice, until. It's a key word. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Right now, God's program is to the nations. You know, he, Jesus told his, his disciples, the Great Commission, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And those who believe, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them obedience to all things I've commanded you. Right now, God's program is to the world. But when the last elect of the Father, chosen before time and predestined, uh, the last one that Christ died on the cross to redeem and ultimately to forgive, the last one that the Holy Spirit comes to of the bride of Christ, the Gentile nations, the last one to step in, at that moment, God's plan with the Gentiles is done. And it initiates that moment when all Israel will be saved. When is that? What are we talking about? I'm not going to set any dates or make any promises. I know better than that. You know, the Old Testament says this. If, if a person claims to be a prophet and they prophesy and they're wrong, you're supposed to stone him to death. I don't want to be in the parking lot with a bunch of stones on me. I'm not going there. Although there are some people over the years that perhaps we should have stoned after they made uh, prognostications that did not come true. But no, okay, grace, grace, uh, mercy, yes. So, so what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in these verses is this. It's a mystery. And it's not just the salvation of ethnic Israel, that they would be saved, but ultimately that they would be restored as a nation. That they would be restored. Paul is making known more than merely the salvation of the Jews as a nation. But he's actually talking about a time frame to come. That would be known as the messianic millennial kingdom. A 1,000 year rule of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth on the throne of King David. In fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises to his people. That's what I had uh, Ian read this morning. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 6 speak clearly uh, five times, I believe, uh, that for a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, Satan will be bound. A thousand years, God's people will rule and reign with him on this earth in the kingdom of God. Israel will finally be the light to the Gentile nations. This time, this e epoch, this era is really the much more that he talked about in verse 12. And it is the life from the dead, I think he spoke about in verse 15. Think with me for a second. What I would like to say is this. Right now, most of us assume, and, and it's not a wrong assumption, but it's just a bad assumption. <laughs> Um, the idea that, the, the, you know, when Jesus Christ comes, that's it. It's it. You know, Jesus is, establishes the eternal kingdom or the eternal state, and we all just, that's it. But that's not it. There's another whole segment of God's redemptive program to come. We just happen to be in the midst of one of those epochs, but there's another whole epoch coming. 
in which God's redemptive plan will play out. So, so follow, follow um, how God's plan is played out through time. So in Genesis chapters 1 through about chapters 9, we have the antediluvian age. That means it refers to the people who lived prior to the flood of Noah's day. And so in that time frame, there was some salvation, very little. Adam and Eve, it says that God made them skins from animals, hence the shedding of blood applied to them would cover their sins. We're told that, you know, Cain killed Abel. Abel offered a correct sacrifice. So we see a few hints at a few people that were right in a right relationship with God. But as time goes on, things devolve and get ugly, really ugly. So it actually says in the Bible that every imagination of the hearts of the people were only wicked continually. And God brought judgment. We don't know how many people lived prior to the flood, but it could have been millions. It could have been millions. How many people made it out alive? Eight. <laughs> that was the sum total of those that we believe at the end of that epoch were saved. They got on the ark as God's judgment played out. That's a remnant. That's a tiny remnant. But what I want you to see in the antediluvian time, a little salvation here, a little salvation there, but largely no. But it does give way to the next epoch, about Genesis chapter 12, all the way through uh, basically the end of the Gospels. We have this epoch where God is now working with the nation of Israel. And God calls Abraham. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. And Jacob has the 12 tribes. And he shows how God draws them and works with them and puts them in the land. And they reject him. And, and God finally ultimately rejects them. How much salvation happened in that epoch? Only a remnant. Just a small sampling of Israel as a whole truly believed. But that has given way to this epoch. This epoch is the time of the church. This is where God has taken the gospel from a, a, a particular group of people and has now extended it to the world. How many people are getting saved today? You know, if you expand the group of people from the nation of Israel, just a small group out of that nation group, that, that's not a lot of people. But if you expand the gospel to the world, even if you have a remnant today, it's a lot more people because there's a lot more Gentiles than there are Jews. But it's still just a small group of people, a remnant in light of all. Has God failed? I mean, really, I mean, has God failed? I mean, only a handful of people in the antediluvian age, about 2,000 years, by the way. And... Um, a small remnant out of the Jewish age, uh, the Old Testament age, um, about 2,000 years, by the way. And then there's the church age, and, and God is, is saving people, but again, it's still just a remnant in light of all the people in the world. And again, 2,000 years, roughly. Interesting. 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 adds up to 6,000 years, but there's another 1,000-year epic, epoch coming. And it is during this rule and reign of Christ on the earth that there will be great salvation. You see, we think we're the end of the story. We're not. We think it's all on us. It isn't. We think God has failed. He didn't. Everything that God has willed will play out. And there is a time frame coming where God will turn his attention and Christ will rule on earth and there will be massive amounts of people coming to Christ. But yet, even at the end of the 1,000 years, Satan who is bound and Christ who is ruling, Satan will be loosed for a season and people will turn to Satan like the sands of the sea and Jesus Christ will ultimately judge them. Do you want to know what the greatest story of the millennium is about? Get this, Christ is ruling and reigning on earth and Satan is bound for a thousand years. And yet at the end of that time, people turn to the devil in mass, large segments. What the millennium kingdom shows us, dear ones, br brace yourself, 
is the depravity of the human heart. No longer will you be able to say, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He's bound. You'll have to say, well, well, uh, uh, and, you know, the reality is this. The human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who even understands it? Apart from a direct act of God through the Holy Spirit and giving us new birth, none of us could ever believe. And so the millennial kingdom reveals the reality of that in so many ways, in so many other things as well. So all of this ultimately issues forward in something called the millennial reign of Christ, the the children of Israel receiving their promises in and through the kingdom of David. Now, I'd like to take just a few minutes. I hope this won't get boring or weird or, or hard to understand. But what I'd like to do is show you how the concept of the millennium that 1,000 years spoken directly in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6 in particular, I'd like you to see how that concept of the millennium determines how people interpret the future. How people interpret the future. There are three primary ways in which people interpret the, the future with reference to today, the future in God's plan. And each one of them has a prefix attached to the word millennium or millennial. And so each of these prefixes will tell you how these people understand the Bible and prophecy, how it's meant to play out. So I'm going to begin with the earliest of all of these views. The earliest view concerning the millennium in the one that guided the church in its infancy is something called the historic pre-millennial view. Now, the word pre is up there because it refers to the coming of Jesus Christ before the millennium. Does that make sense to you? It is the pre-millennial return of Christ, and then the millennium plays out. So so this is um, what the earliest church fathers held to. This was their view of the future in God's plan according to God's word. And and so um, the earliest disciples of the disciples held to this view. This is actually Jewish eschatology. The earliest church was Jewish. This was their expectation as a people that someday God's going to bring the kingdom in. Jesus, when's the kingdom coming? So the earliest view of of how how the end times plays out is connected to the expectations of the Jews. And so this is how it works. The church represents today the age of the church. Those who are born again, placed into the body of Christ. Those who are the living stones who, who become the habitation of the Holy Spirit. This is the church, those who are born again. But I'd like you to notice, according to the earliest understanding of the future, is that the church would go through the tribulation. That they would go through the the hardship, the challenges, the, the, the great tribulation that was to come, according to the scriptures, according to Jesus, and ultimately played out in the book of Revelation. And they believed that through the tribulation, ultimately the second coming of Christ would happen. But in that moment, they also believed that the rapture would happen. The rapture being living saints taken into the presence of Christ and glorified. And the first resurrection is those who are dead saints. Their bodies would be raised to meet Christ in the air. And so this was the early understanding. It was a pre-millennial view. And so then we will be with the Lord for a thousand years as he rules and reigns in the millennium, at the end of which Satan is loosed and, and, and people are judged. And the second resurrection is of the damned. They're cast into the lake of fire. And that issues forth in, in really Romans 20, 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. This is the earliest view of prophecy within the church. It is a pre-millennial view. Now, this view stood uh, the test of time for about three or four hundred years. This was the dominant view. Um, But it began, let me give you some names of people who basically hold that view even today. 
And so those who would uh, today hold to what's called a premillennial, the historic premillennial view, uh, a man by the name of George Eldon Ladd, Albert Moeller, John Piper, Francis Schaeffer, D.A. Carson, Carl F. Henry, Randy Alcorn, as well as Wayne Grud Grudem. So there's some great theologians in that grouping, and some of you know Randy Alcorn. He wrote a book called Heaven. And these, so these, these men, uh, these people, uh, basically affirm the historic pre-mill view of the church from the first, second, third centuries. That view began to give way to a different view. Along about the 400s, it began to give way. And a lot of that had to do with Augustine's writing of the city of God. You see, when the golden age of the church in Rome began, it began with Constantine's legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire about 311 AD, and later Christianity's declaration as the religion of Rome in 380 AD all seemed well. We've come through a terrible time of persecution. They hated us. They stoned us. They put us in arenas. They killed us. They crucified us. But now they love us. We're, we're the church of Rome. We, we, you know, they, they, they began to believe, oh, we've entered into the millennium. The, old, the Jewish mindset was starting to play out in their minds. But that became a problem. When Rome was sacked by the barbarians in 410 A.D., well, wait a minute, how can this be the millennial kingdom if the barbarians can take over Rome? And they began to get threatened and worried. The golden age of the millennium got over too soon for them. And so the millennial reign of Christ, this is what happened. The millennial reign of Christ was now reinterpreted from a literal, physical, earthly kingdom to a spiritual kingdom. And so today, there is a view called ah, millennial. Again, pre-millennial helps you to understand a particular version of the future. Ah, millennial gives you an understanding of this view of the future. And notice how the millennium goes from the death of Christ all the way to the return of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus started this, notice, symbolic period of time called the millennium. A very long age of conflict between the people of God and the enemies of God. So they took what was the literal physical kingdom of Christ on earth and said, nope, <laughs> we're just going to spiritualize it. And so today, there are so many groups that hold to amillennialism. Uh, in fact, uh, the Lutherans do, Presbyterians do. Dutch Reform do, most Anglicans do, a lot of Methodists do, Amish do, Old Order Mennonites do, and on and on and on. And this is the view that R.C. Sproul would take. In other words, it's only a spiritual kingdom. It was never meant to be literal, physical on earth. And so today, uh, those who hold this view would say that the church in heaven is ruling with Christ. They are the church triumphant. They're there. But those on earth are the church militant. We're still fighting the battle. Someday we'll be with the church victorious. And so this is another viewpoint uh, of how the end times are meant to play out. And again, it all revolves around the view of the millennium. And it's some indeterminate point in the future. Again, the word millennium doesn't even fit here because it's already been 2,000 years. So the word millennium means 1,000, so that doesn't even work. And one other side effect of this is that there is no Israel. There is no future for Israel. There is no national ethnic entity of Israel in the future at all. They have merely been assumed into the church. And so all the blessings of Israel of old have been given to the church, and all the cursings of Israel of old have fallen on them, and they've been judged. There is no future for Israel in this view. Are we tracking? Does any of this make any sense? We're just trying to understand how people view the future. And there are a lot of people today who would be amillennial. In fact, a lot of people today would be amillennial. They would just say, yeah, yeah, that's my understanding of the future. Jesus is ruling and reigning in heaven now. One of these days I'll be joining him and someday he'll return and then begins the eternal state. So there's a lot of folks who hold this viewpoint. Pre-mill. Christ returns prior to the physical, literal millennial kingdom and rule and reigns on earth for a thousand years. Amil, the word A actually negates the word millennial, so it's like there's really no millennium. It's all spiritualized, it's in heaven, it's already been there for 2,000 years in this view. And here's the third view that people hold, 
And this is what is called the post-millennial view. Post meaning that after the millennium has been set up on earth and reigned for a thousand years, it is at that point that Jesus Christ will return to uh, have the final judgment and begin the new heavens and new earth. So in this view, there is a gradual conversion of most of the world's, uh, most of the world is conquered, uh, conquers evil and injustice, prompting a return to Jesus Christ. So this is the view that the gospel succeeds. We preach gospel, we, we preach Christ, and people believe, and more people believe, and more people believe, and more people believe. This actually kind of rose up uh, in the 1700s, a time of progressivism. It was a time of industrialism. It was the time of colonialism. It was a time of enlightenment. Everything's getting better. Everything's getting better. And, <laughs> and, and so their viewpoint was, you know, this is good. This is great. Obviously, the gospel is going to take over the world. And so this became a very popular viewpoint for a while. And, and, and again, um, and so, yes, it, 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 um, some of the reformers uh, from Europe and England held this position. Jonathan Edwards, who was the greatest uh, theologian that America has produced to this point, held to this view. It was very popular among evangelicals from 1870 to 1915. And what happened in 1915-16, Michael? <laughs> World War I happened. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, Things don't look so rosy anymore. And then after World War I, what came next? World War II. Millions die. And all of a sudden, people start reassessing this. Ah, ah, this is looking bad. And then after World War II was over, the Korean conflict, and then communism. Millions die. Many millions die. And all of a sudden, this view was like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. It's funny how the times in which people live determine their views of the future, not the scriptures so much. And so this for many years was just kind of put in the background. Nobody really cared. However, and I need to say this, it has received a resurgence lately. Again, in light of the times in which we live. Many people today under the, the umbrella of Christian nationalism are revitalizing this old view to say, in effect, no, we will advance the kingdom of God no matter what. Jesus Christ will rule on earth through the government, and we will see that that's what happens. And so it has been reconstituted today, reinvented for today. Some of the people who hold to this are like a man by the name of Gary North. Some of you know that name. Kenneth Gentry, uh, Greg Bashan. Here's a name some of you will know. Doug Wilson is one of the people who holds this. James White is another person who holds this view. It is a growing viewpoint in our day. More and more people are saying, I'm with you. We need to take back this country. We need to put Jesus on the throne. We need to make the government submission to Christ the King now. That's a growing view today. But again, it is the times in which people live that cause them to interpret the scriptures. That's not wise. The scriptures themselves should be clear. Okay, um, so those are the three views. It is... Christ will return prior to the millennial kingdom, set up a 1,000-year reign on earth. This is what really Paul was speaking into. The Amil version came along because things didn't seem to play out the way people anticipated, so they just spiritualized Christ's kingdom. That's still a strong viewpoint today. And then the idea of post-millennialism, Christ will return after we establish the kingdom on earth through our own efforts, and the gospel is, is growing in its inclusion. I have yet to mention the most popular viewpoint today. Today, by far, the most popular viewpoint of the end times is what we would call the dispensational pre-millennial view. Um, again, uh, this is by far the most popular. Its origina originators were J.N. Darby, William Kelly. It was popularized by the C.I. Schofield Bible. Ever heard of C.I. Schofield? My first Bible. When I got saved, a man by the name of Ben Conant said, hey, Bill, let, let's go get you a Bible. So he took me to some lady's house. I don't know who she was. It was in Harrison. 
And she had a little bookstore on her front porch. And we walk in there, and Ben's looking around. He said, we're going to get you a Bible, Bill. I said, okay, Ben, that sounds great. So he picked this Bible out for me. It is a 1945 edition of the 1909 edition of the Schofield Reference Bible. So I spent the first 12 years of ministry cutting my teeth in the Schofield Reference Bible. And so this was a thing. This helped to push this viewpoint further into our day and age. Now, notice the difference between the premillennial view, the historic premillennial view, and the dispensational premillennial view. It is the timing of when the church is raptured. Here, in this view, the church is raptured prior to the seven-year tribulation, which there's a peace treaty, Antichrist is revealed, and then Armageddon finally plays out and Christ returns. So in other words, the church is removed prior to the tribulational period. That got a lot of traction in the beginning of the last uh, century, and it grew through the popularity of C.I. Schofield's Bible. It also grew through books. Tell me, are any of you familiar with these book series? The whole point of the Left Behind series is a rapture happens, and there are people who are left behind, yes. And yeah, you know, and, and so this, this likewise on a very popular level continued to push this concept forward as well. Um, boy, the number of people who hold to this, John Walvoord was one of the early guys back in the 1950s, Hal Lindsey, the great, late great planet Earth, Charles Ryrie, you know, his famous study Bible, John MacArthur, this is his view, Master Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, Capital Bible Seminary, I went to Capital Bible Seminary, this was the view of Capital Bible Seminary, Moody Bible Institute, this is the view of Moody Bible Institute, uh, most charismatic churches, um, fundamentalist groups, and Baptists hold to this view of the future. This view has reinvigorated the original Jewish view, the historic premillennial view. It's added some other features, but we have come back around in many ways to the earliest understanding of how the future plays out. God has a plan. Now, exactly what does that plan look like? There's a lot of debate, isn't there? I mean, good people are on all sides of these issues. I mean, there are godly people in all manner of these issues. What does it look like? Let me just end with these words. God has a plan, and he is playing it out in real time. What does that mean concerning national ethnic Israel. How are we to view Israel today? They are in unbelief. Many of the things they seek to do are not good, right, or just. How are we to look at them as a nation today? Paul gives us good understanding. Notice what he says. As regards the gospel, they, Israel, are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, that's the selection of God, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and the calling of God are what? They, they can't be taken back. God's promises cannot be removed. He has to fulfill them. For, now notice, for just as you were at one time disobedient to God, do you remember those days? I remember those days. Very keenly, I remember being in rebellion to God. God, but now we have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by mercy, notice, that by the mercy shown to who? You, Gentiles, again, he's putting his finger on the Gentiles. There was some issues there. There was some anti-Semitism going on in, back in that day and in that church. But I want you to understand, they also may now receive mercy. 
His desire was that the church would so live being the church that Israel would become jealous and that people would believe. He hasn't changed his mind on this. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So how are we to relate to Israel today? How are we to understand this, this group of people who are about to celebrate their 75th anniversary in the land in unbelief? We need to be merciful. As we have received mercy, we are to extend mercy. And we are to pray for them. Pray for salvation of the remnant. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that will only happen when the Prince of Peace comes. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh God, that the plan would soon come for the completion of this epoch. Even so, come Lord Jesus and institute the kingdom on earth. That's what we need to be praying. That's what we need to be asking God for. That's what we should be longing for. Oh, finish it up and move on to the next part. Because in that next part, we get to rule and reign with Christ. <laughs> How many would prefer that over this life right now? Oh, my goodness. We'll start praying. <laughs> Pray hard. You know, we're told that we can hasten the day. How do you do that? Pray. Oh, pray. Pray. So how do we treat Israel today as a nation, as an entity? We show them mercy because we know that God is not done with them. We know that God has a plan. When exactly that will play out, we don't know. Again, I'm not setting any dates, but it is soon on the horizon. Now concerning us as a church, wow, it got late fast. I'm sorry. I just got, I got like I've had a month to work on this. That's my bad. Concerning us as a church, I cut my teeth on the original Schofield Reference Bible. I attended Capital Bible Seminary. For years and years, I have held to a pre tribulational, premillennial view. And uh, I'm not saying that it's wrong by any means. But as I continue to study Scripture and try to understand the teachings of Scripture, I, I have to admit that I'm moving more and more towards a historic premill conviction which means that the church will go through the tribulation. I hope I'm wrong. Let me say that out loud. I hope I'm wrong. And if Jesus Christ pulls the church out prior to the tribulation, on the way up, I'll be the first one to say, I'm wrong. Yes, I'm so glad I'm wrong. But if I'm right, my job is to prepare us for suffering. That's my job, is to help us to understand that the day will come where at any cost we will read God's word, pray, worship, gather with other believers and witness for Christ and nothing will stop us from doing these things with willing and glad hearts. Dear ones, only God knows the ultimate play out of things. Can I just, I want to just say this in, in closing. I know I said that three times now, so I'm really like Paul in Philippians. Now in closing, now in closing, now in closing. Why wasn't God ultimately clearer? If this matters so much, if this is so important, why, why isn't everything just, here, here, is, here it is, and boom, 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 boom. No apocalyptic literature, none of that stuff which makes figures and difficulties to understand. Boom, 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 boom. Why didn't he just lay it out so clear to us? One person put it this way. The Bible's teaching on eschatology is fundamentally ethical in its character and purpose. It's exhortations to watchfulness and readiness for an imminent yet remote sudden event. Logically, this seems to be a contradiction, but the tension has an ethical purpose to make date setting impossible and therefore demand constant readiness of life. That's the point. That's the point. Even Paul, here in Romans chapter 11, oh, look at all God's doing. Israel's going to be saved. Yes, oh, praise God. Chapter 12, verse 1 says what? 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, because of the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is a spiritual act of worship. You see, we can, we can play with dates, and we can have a good time. We can go to conferences, we can do all that stuff. We can get books and read them all through and, and, and pin everything down. But that's not the point. The point is that we would be a holy, redeemed, purified people who are looking for Christ and living in a sense of readiness, giving our lives fully to him. That's why no date was given. Oh, God knows us so well. So on June 6, 2032, Jesus is returning. Now, I didn't say that. It was a joke. Okay, here we go. But this is human nature. This is human nature. June 6, 30, 32, I'm going to live it up until like June 5th. And then I'm going to repent. Oh, yeah. Jesus, forgive me. Oh, look, we're in the kingdom. Yeah, God knows better than that. We're, we're, he, he, he knows us better than we know ourselves. So he didn't fix a date. He just said, I'm coming. Are you ready? I'm coming. Are you ready? That's the point. Let's pray. Father, you have fixed a date. You have a known determined moment where you will tap the shoulder of your son and say, go, go. And you will initiate the kingdom of God on earth and you, O oh Lord Jesus, will rule and reign for a thousand years with those who are yours. It's coming. It is coming. There is no doubt. All the scriptures scream of it. Paul reiterates it today in Romans 11. The question is not what's your system, not can you, can you order all the events, not have you been watching the news to see how it all plays out. The question is, are you ready? Oh, dear God. I pray that the Holy Spirit would use these closing moments just to speak to us. If Jesus Christ were to return today, are you ready? Are you ready to stand before the Lord? Are you ready to give an accounting of your life? Are you ready to say, Jesus, apart from your wounds and blood, I have no hope. Lord Jesus, my faith is in you and you know that. What about you today? Be ready. Be ready. Father, we do pray for the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the nation of Israel. We ask that that celebration would be not marred by lots of bombings and, and hate. But we do know that it's going to get ugly before it gets better. We just ask that you would bring forth the kingdom soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We long for that day. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.